from Simply Grow and tonight we are going to chat to Helen McMahon from Goody Training Solutions. We are going to chat about um, all those scenarios we maybe don't want to think about um, but they probably are at the back of my uh, our mind somewhere. Uh, so things like choking, things like um, burns, cuts, all those things that can happen to us. Uh, let me just quickly get um, Helen on. There we go. I'll be able to start. I know quite a few of you were interested in the topic, so I hope you're going to enjoy tonight's chat. Hi, Helen. Hi, Hi how are you? Are you Good well? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. It's just such a weird day. Today's in it with the change of weather. I just feel so okay. sleepy. I was just posting earlier. I had a nap of a lifetime today. <laughs> which You're is just right. Yeah, just, I, just so I, unlike I, me. Yeah. Sometimes I go for a nap. Do you? Oh, you see, I'm one of those people who <laughs> try, to, try to fight it and, and not do it. But then today was just like, you know what? On the lockdown, at least one nap is allowed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good to see you. You look lovely. You look glowing. What's your secret? Tropic. Oh, of course. <laughs> I wish there was a simpler solution. <laughs> you look lovely. It's as simple as... Um... Yeah, a year and a half of using Tropic products, and well, we might chat about that later. But I think that most people are going to tune in uh, today just to um, hear all about the not so nice things, not as nice as Tropic. I yeah, but I think it's just so important because um, I know that it's probably on everyone's mind somewhere at the back that you know, oh my gosh, what would I do if something like that happened? In an ideal world, we should all have pediatric uh, first aid course done. Yeah, but we don't live in an ideal world so maybe we can chat tonight um a little bit about these different scenarios and uh, yeah. first thing what to do because yeah. you're an expert would you like to introduce yourself really quickly first for those who don't know you so um i'm helen mcmahon and i'm the owner of goody training solutions and i um i travel throughout northern ireland delivering training in all areas of first aid so pediatrics um, emergency first aid at work first aid at work sports first aid you name it. Um, and I also do uh, food safety training as well. So my background is actually hospitality industry. That's where I came from. Um, mm -hmm. And then ended up training. Um, love it. Absolutely love it. Um, very, very lucky that I'm doing a job that I love. Yeah, with. fantastic. That's, that's why I thought I would um, have you on because I did my pediatric first aid course with you and I loved it, as, as weird as it may sound. But you, you just come across as so passionate and knowledgeable. So I thought it would be great to, to have you uh, with this live. So why don't we just dive straight in? Okay. Choking. <laughs> so um, if it happens, um, why does it happen? When can it happen? What to do, basically, if you don't mind yeah. just talking. So there's, for a start, there's a difference between gagging and choking. A lot of children will gag, and you can tell because of the tongue, okay? Um, mm. But child is choking it's actually something physically blocking their airways and you know that with toddlers as soon as they're able to start reaching for things then everything goes into the mouth and it's all to do with that coordination and the sensory you know all about the sensory so yeah. it goes to the mouth um so they'll choke on coins or batteries or um even like i've heard it on people on first aid courses where they've said my child used to like go behind the tv and get the fluff uh, you know, like we're the Hadden Hoover, yeah. you, you don't pull out your TV every day, do you? Yeah. Work, find that. Um, and, and choked on, you know, like, like fluff. So children will put anything in their mouth. Um, so it's, yeah, it's about dealing with that. And this is where it's so important that everybody has some basic knowledge of first aid because an awful lot of people have the attitude of, it'll never happen to me. It'll never happen to me. Yeah. Other people. Until it happens. Doesn't yeah. happen. And then when it happens, they realise, oh my goodness, I need to do something about this. Oh, there was a little. And, and that's when they then they then look about doing something. So um, if a baby chokes, then I have I have a little baby here. Oh, fantastic. fantastic. You're prepared. Oh. <laughs> I think I recognise the baby. <laughs> From the course I did with you, yes, my, that's the best. <laughs> um, so it's very hard to show you um, on here, but and I'm going to be doing a video on this next week on my Facebook page as well, so anybody can have a look there. As well, because they're fantastic. Yeah, 
Um, so you hold the baby on your arm. That's quite hard to see, but you hold the baby on your arm. Folks, it really is about giving them a good hard tap because a lot of people think, oh, I'm scared if I hurt them. What happens if I hurt them? Well, the reality is if you don't get this shifted, this baby could die, okay? So yeah. and the reality of it, that sounds harsh, but that's true. And a lot of... Um, not not a lot, but there are children that die from choking. The actual highest fatality rate from choking is the over 70s. People think it's children because it's children that we hear about, but it's actually yeah. 70s. Um, so you do need to give them a good hard tap with the heel of your hand. So this mm -hmm. part of your hand here, and it's yeah. in between the shoulder blades. So in here, that's where you need to be hitting them. And it is, you know, a nice hard tap like that. And yeah. you five of those. Okay, so five, and you're looking in between, has this come out? Mm -hmm. um, and if it hasn't come out, then the baby comes across onto this arm and supported, and you use two fingers. So um, if you've done baby CPR, uh, you'll know that you're using two fingers to do CPR on the baby. So with the baby then for choking, again, it's chest thrusts. Adults are different and children are different. We use abdominal mm -hmm. thrusts, but for baby, we'll use chest thrusts. Yeah. So Two fingers where you would do your CPR. So in the center of the chest, I lift baby up, and it's mm -hmm. good, sharp chest thrusts. And again, yeah. up to five of those. Um, mm -hmm. If that hasn't cleared it, then you go back to the back blows, and then mm -hmm. you keep alternating five back blows, five uh, chest thrusts, five back blows, five chest thrusts until you mm -hmm. get it cleared. If you don't get it cleared, and the baby goes unconscious, and obviously it's not breathing normally because their airway is blocked. Then you mm -hmm. need CPR, mm -hmm. right. and and that can happen quite quickly. You know, mm -hmm. within three four minutes, this baby could be unconscious, not breathing. Mm -hmm. right, you need to start CPR. Mm -hmm. So it's and there's nothing that we put in the mouth because it ends with some people naturally you try to yeah well, naturally you try and yeah but, but you actually run the risk of pushing it further on yeah. down and that's the problem with that mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people do and it, it's for and once if it goes further down you're not going to get it so your the advice is is that it's the five back blows mm -hmm. and also resist the urge to get the baby and start upside down that's you know again but that's people's reaction they think that mm -hmm. if they shake the baby upside down then that's going to clear this blockage. It's not. The the airway has closed, essentially. This is blocking the airway completely. So shaking the baby upside down is not going to help. In fact, what you're going to do is call the brain injury. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it's so I just that taps and that has to be five of them. Yeah. And that so five, back blows, out. five chest thrusts, five back blows, five chest thrusts. Keep going mm -hmm. until you get it. And obviously, scream for somebody to phone you an ambulance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. When it comes to food, are there any uh, culprits that um, cause choking most often? Anything well, that we should be great. aware of? It, it like, just, oh, it, no, about the brain. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, the I think now everybody has been very well educated on cutting the grapes in half yeah. lengthway. Uh, some people cut them in quarters, which is even better. Um, <sighs> other things... And just and with with babies, I suppose it's different. But when you get on to children, it could be cocktail sausages, or a big big thing with children, um, and especially at like you know like kids' birthday parties or something, yeah. where they're sort of grabbing the food and then they're running because they want to continue playing with their friends. Yeah, and that's when these things happen. Um, lollipops, you know the chubba chub lollipops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They used to be much bigger than what they are now. They're they're tiny. Yeah, there's many ones I've seen. Yeah. yeah, and to me, they're 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 the exact right size for just causing a blockage. Oh. So mm -hmm. a lot of parents have have banned them. They just don't they don't, have, they don't let the kids have them, um, because. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases where they've come off the stick and the child has choked um on mm -hmm. them. So mm -hmm. yeah. things like blueberries would be too small, wouldn't they? To blueberries would be very small. But I mean it could still happen, especially if children get a handful. And I you know suppose, yeah. yeah, like that. Mm -hmm. Um okay. and the toys, toys is the other thing. Uh Lego men, or the heads of Lego men. Mm -hmm. um, anything really can cause a child to choke. Mm -hmm. As we're talking about Lego men and small toys, can we very quickly move on to things poking out of noses? <laughs> because that just made me think about it. So, so when they hands shove them out, is... they can shove something in different yeah, parts. If of... anything shoved into the ear, you need to bring them to uh, to get medic. You need to get that properly. That's 
important. I remember that from my course. Obviously, I remember everything. You could just test me. Don't, but <laughs> obviously you could. Uh, but that's the, the first thing. You see something poking, the natural instinct is it's to just fine. get it out. I yeah. suppose if it's a leg or band and the head's here and you can see the legs and everything and it's, it's you know, you're not causing any, just to remove it, you can see it very clearly. But if, you know, there's been stories of children with millions. Do you know the sweets, the millions, the strawberry millions? yeah, yeah. yeah things in their ears up their nose um you can't start to move those yourself you have to you have to get them removed properly so but mm -hmm. you know up until lockdown we were very lucky in the north down on ours area where we had two minor injuries you know it's, there's one in ours and, yeah. and that's you know perfect for if something's stuck somewhere um but just you know they don't x-ray children and things in, in minor injuries um ours minor injuries is still open so i would still be taking a child there um, okay something no. stuck mm -hmm. somewhere where it shouldn't be mm -hmm. and if yeah and just leave it there but if um if your minor injuries is not open just any any absolutely you know yeah. and this is this is a really really important point there the numbers of people going to a and e have drastically reduced i mean really really reduced a and e's are really sitting empty now apart from you know, people are up with COVID, and it's actually quite a worrying thought because, well, it's one or two things. All the people who went previously probably didn't need to be there. Okay. Yeah. Right. Or people who have ill people who should be in a and &E are scared to go because of the COVID situation. Folks, the people in a and &E, the people in pediatric wards, etc., are geared up for this. They have got their PPE. They've got everything else. And please, please, please do not let COVID stop you from going to a and &E. If you need to go to a and &E, please... Mm. Any. I was reading a report um, from one of the uh, senior consultants in the Southwest Acute Hospital in Fermanagh, that's where I'm from, but he's the, he's one of the stroke consultants and he said mm -hmm. he was really, really worried about the um, the lesser numbers now that are going with stroke and he thinks that there are people mm -hmm. who are having maybe many strokes or TIAs at home who are just scared to go to a &E so they won't go. Mm -hmm. um, they mm -hmm. need treatment, they need to go. So yeah, and I said, with those things no you would think to yourself i don't want to go anywhere near the hospital but actually you should absolutely absolutely if you need emergency treatment or if you have an accident you need to go to any &E and don't mm -hmm. don't let anything put you off going so yeah mm -hmm. but things like burns and cuts you can easily treat yourself at home can't you absolutely so mm -hmm. um minor burns now if it's if it's you'll remember from the pediatric course agatha that if it's <laughs> anything <laughs> children if you know if a child gets a, a cup of coffee you know typically burns to children are children reaching up to pull down the pot off the stove or pull you know mm -hmm. put a cup of coffee on the table the child reaches up and it spills over them um burns to children should get looked at they absolutely should get looked at um if it's mm -hmm. something really incredibly minor then cold running water for 20 minutes i actually posted a video of burns today um yes. yeah. on my social media pages and it was it was all based on burns and there is you know when you should go to hospital um how you treat a burn so cold running water for 20 minutes i would also advise sorry let me just reach and get something are you okay just make sure you don't go <laughs> but every parent yeah. should have one of these in the house okay these are burns dressings now they do not replace cold running water cold running water is still what you should be using for a burn but if you then have to transport that child to the hospital or adult, okay, mm -hmm. um, a burns dressing will continue to cool the burn en route to the hospital. Okay. okay. So cool it with cold running water um, mm -hmm. then apply the burns dressing and bring it to the hospital. If you don't have a burns dressing, then the dressing of choice for a burn would be cling film. And everybody mm -hmm. should probably have cling film. In yeah. That, I imagine so. Um, so if you take off sort of like the first two you know, but then the rest of it's sterile and cling film doesn't stick to anything except itself. So it won't stick to the burn. If you try and put a wind dressing or a bandage, it's just going to stick to the burn and make an off. Mm -hmm. yes. so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and now let's talk a little bit about cuts and then we can maybe dress the first aid kits at home because you mentioned what we should have. So can we just um, yeah. address a little bit? So again, minor cuts. Um, Never underestimate the power and the healing power of a plaster. 
with children, honestly. Um, and if you can have a choice of Ben 10 or Peppa Pig or whatever it happens to be, um, children will miraculously get better from their, from their cut. <laughs> um, so minor cuts, you don't need to be using antiseptic wipes or anything like that. If it's a minor cut, some gauze um, and some water some clean water and give it a clean, get a plaster on it and away you go. If it's deeper, the, the rule is, does it need stitches? It needs to go to hospital. If they don't need stitches, you deal with it yourself at home. Okay, and that's mm -hmm. very, very simply how we deal with cuts. Um, so if it's a, a, a more serious wound, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe they've been at the top of the slide and they've fallen off onto the ground or whatever and they've got a you know quite a bad wound to their head the general rule of thumb is if it's an upper body injury you sit them down and if it's a lower body injury you would lie them down okay for, mm -hmm. for quite a big wound um apply pressure and applying pressure means that you close the mouth of the wound because a lot of people mm -hmm. apply pressure means how tightly can i tie a bandage and it's not because any sort of can stop the circulation um so it's about closing the mouth of the wound so get pressure onto the wound um, and then arrange for transportation to the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, I don't you know that worry about it or anything because the first thing they're going to do at the hospital is clean it anyway. Okay. When do you know it's deep enough to um, need stitches? Well, if you, if you apply pressure for about, well, it, obviously if it's something like an arterial bleed, which yeah, you're, I, I, touch wood, <laughs> you're never going to come across that. Okay. If it's an ambulance, so that's... That's ambulance straight away. Um, but if it, you'll know by the amount, of, by, by just how deep it is and by the amount of blood there is. Um, you'll know yourself whether, it, you know, I can I can close this myself, hold those, and it's going to hold, or no, that's definitely not. That needs stitches. But okay. again, stitches, um, you could bring to minor injuries and say, I'm not sure of the age now of when they will when they will stitch a child but minor injuries are brilliant and it's a very underutilized resource you can be mm -hmm. in and out of minor injuries and you still haven't been seen by triage in, in the hospital yeah yeah i remember you said that in our course as well and now can we just quickly move on to the first aid kit so um at regular household uh what should you have in your first aid kit so you don't need to have a green box that says first aid on it people think oh no i have to go out and get this you know, really special box. No, you don't. You can have a, a cupboard, a designated cupboard that you know that that's a cupboard we go to or it could be Quality Street tin or whatever it happens to be. Um, plasters are a must. Um, wound dressings. Okay, so wound dressings are a bandage and a dressing in the one um, thing, if you like. Um, yeah. It does away with the whole trying to hold a bit of gauze in place and trying to wrap a bandage on at the same time. So mm -hmm. wound dressings. But I would advise you to have small wound dressings and maybe one or two medium. A lot of people say, oh, well, better get large, right? I've never used a large wound dressing, okay? So small, um, more small than medium. Um, mm -hmm. Then you need to have a pair of scissors in there, okay? Just in case you need to, because some people buy the fabric roll bandages. Now, obviously this is home, what you're having at home. This is no yeah. thing. Um, some normal bandages you may have, crepe bandages um mm -hmm. you don't need to have a lot of people think that they need to have sterile water the vials of sterile water if you've mm -hmm. got access to mains running water you don't need to have those okay you can mm -hmm. use your mains running water um mm -hmm. and then if you want to have the things like germaline or whatever you know in your home first aid kit yeah absolutely you can have mm -hmm. them yeah okay dog and with things like this, I'm thinking about the medical cupboard that everyone's got somewhere at home and things like um, paracetamol and ibuprofen for children. And I think it's about ibuprofen and paracetamol. I would always, I would always recommend that you have some paracetamol in the house. Um, okay. Because I know that when my son was small, he all of a sudden, um, one evening, just his whole face swole up and his eyes were streaming. Um, and it was the next door neighbour having cotton grass. So he all of a sudden just, you know, had this react, which was obviously just really, really bad hay fever. Um, yeah. Burton cleared that up really, really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I would recommend Again, about branded stuff because we all have in our head Calpol Puritan, and um, it's exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. As You're just paying four pounds more expensive. That you don't actually have to pay for the brand. Yeah, it's 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 a wee bit like 
um, Heinz beans and your supermarket value beans, they're both made in the same factory. They've got a different label on them. Mm -hmm. So I, it, there is a, I'm not sure what the website's called, but you can look up the code on the back of it. Which yeah. Is, it's exactly the same. So I, honestly, I would be buying Tesco's own paracetamol, Tesco's mm -hmm. own paracetamol, Tesco's own ibuprofen. You're, you're just mm -hmm. for a name with Calpol. Mm -hmm. You can probably just check it on the shelf as well. If you've got Calpol and own brand on the shelf, you can just check those numbers. Yeah. The time yeah. the time of day. Okay, very good. And now um, with trips to A&E, we mentioned um, deeper cuts. We mentioned burns with children, um, choking when there's loss of consciousness. Anything else that we should go straight to, to way to A&E when it comes to children? Yeah. Do you see if, you, if your child isn't well, and you know in your heart of hearts that this is not a runny nose, this is not a cold, this is, your child is not well. And the reason why I'm saying that is meningitis, okay? Meningitis is, it's rare. It is rare in children. Um, however, it does happen. And when it happens, we tend to hear about the, the really horrific stories, okay? Of children dying or losing limbs or whatever. Um, if you're, if you in your heart of hearts know that there's something not right and you suspect meningitis, okay, I kind of just said that stage, the rash may be the last thing to occur or the rash may not occur at all, okay? Um, go straight to A&E. Don't even go to your GP. Just bypass the GP and go straight to A&E. Um, it is vitally important that the child gets seen and tested really, really quickly. As yeah. I said, it is rare, but it does happen and people... Um, I suppose we all have this sense of we don't want to waste anybody's time. You know, we don't want to go to any because, you know, we could be wasting time. We don't want to go to the GP because we waste their time. If there's nothing wrong, then we'll feel really stupid. Um, mm. But I'm a great believer in trusting your gut instinct. Absolutely. Yeah. Trust your gut instinct. As a parent, you know your child better than anybody else. And if you know there's just something not right here, just go to mm -hmm. any. Yeah. Go they will never send you back with a child will they no. if you are there with a child that's you know suspecting something is wrong they will always yeah. examine I, children all you'll find that if you go up to any with a child they do try to take them in quite quickly you know they they do try to prioritize them and get them in quite quickly because they know it's difficult you know sitting mm -hmm. for six hours with a child is no fun so they do no. try to bring them in um, much quicker and um, if when you've seen the you know the doctor who's an NA and you're still not happy you're perfectly within your rights to ask for a second opinion you mm -hmm. know hey, look I'm just it's just I'm just not 100% look is it possible I could speak to the pediatric registrar is he available just he she available just for a couple of minutes get mm -hmm. a second opinion you're perfectly entitled to ask for a second opinion mm -hmm. if you're That's thank you and now um if we can just quickly do the question that we had before we move on to food safety. And um, because we had a question about um, allergies and uh, one of the moms asked about um, her two boys with allergies, no anaphylaxis, but she is just worried if they don't have any EpiPens, if anaphylactic shock happens, yeah. what should we do? So um, these children have been tested um, because they, they know that some foods are produced yeah. for them, so they have been tested. If there was a risk, that child's going to... So there's anaphylaxis and there's anaphylactic shock. So two slightly different things. If there mm -hmm. was a risk that that child was going to go into anaphylactic shock, I can guarantee you that those children would have auto-injectors. They definitely would have auto-injectors. Okay. Now, if they do, because anybody can develop an allergic reaction to anything at any age, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that... Um, you know, I'm 42 now, um, and let's say I was a lover of shellfish. I hate shellfish, but let's say I was a lover of shellfish, and tomorrow evening I decided to have uh, prawns or whatever. There's nothing to say that I couldn't just all of a sudden my body mm -hmm. just decides, no, do you know what? Mm -hmm. No, and it has this massive. What are the signs? Hmm? Sorry to interrupt you, but what are the signs? So if you are a parent of a child and you are giving them some kind of food, and how would you know that? something is not right what are the signs of so the, the, um, it would start with the well it, they're all different that's the thing there's no there's no two allergic reactions will be the same so some of them mm -hmm. will start with itching and um a rash starting to develop and all 
all children and adults, um, regardless of whether they have auto injectors or not, also have antihistamines. So they'll be told that you take the antihistamine. Now, unless it's a severe reaction where they actually can't breathe, their airway slows and they can't breathe, then they must go straight to auto injector. Um, but otherwise, if they're getting a rash and they start to itch or scratch, scratch or their, their eyes start to swell or anything, their um, care plan will actually say that they start with their antihistamine and hopefully the antihistamine mm -hmm. will reverse those effects. But if, you know, if those children are concerned, if they start with like... <gasps> 999 straight away um, you need an ambulance and state on that phone call that you suspect it's anaphylactic shock um, okay. that is then a category one call so anaphylactic shock would be category so um, the ambulance service is triaged just like you're triaged in hospital um, so anaphylactic mm -hmm. category one call so if it was going somewhere to somebody with a broken leg and there was a call for anaphylactic shock it would be diverted to you um, mm -hmm. and the rapid response unit will hopefully be out very very quickly and they will carry auto injectors with them as well mm -hmm. um but the tests will have been done and they obviously from their results have thought that no there's not a risk here of anaphylactic mm -hmm. shock so uh, to answer this mum's question if anything that happens just call the and, ambulance straight away and, and absolutely try with the um with the antihistamine presumably they have paritin although they may have a stronger they may have a stronger antihistamine mm -hmm. I would imagine. And with, with allergies, it all happens pretty quickly, doesn't it? So if there it was some kind happen, of allergen. Quickly, it can develop over sort of 15, 20 minutes or it okay. can be than that. Okay, so it's about, okay. um, you know, if the child suddenly starts to go, well, let's suspect, suspect an allergic reaction and get the antihistamine. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that doesn't work, 999. Mm-hmm. But if, the breath, if, if they've started to go sure. and their, their throat's closing up, it's 999 straight away. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. I just remember, 999 straight away. Yeah. And that actually brings us really nicely to food safety, talking about food and allergens. It's all kind of flowing. <laughs> it all makes sense. Yeah. So when it comes to food safety at home, we probably don't really think about it too much. We know you prepare your food and, and that's it. But actually, there was one thing you posted on your social media that made me really question myself. <laughs> There was something, um, I think I knew that before, but you know those the time of reaction on sprays that we use in the kitchen? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, so when you've got your multi-surface spray, you yep. just spray it and wipe it to clean the surface, but actually at the back, it tells you that you should leave it for whatever amount of time it is for it to work. And I kind of think I knew that, but actually, until I saw it again, I don't think I was doing it properly. Yeah. Um, so whatever your your antibacterial spray is whether it's Dettol or um, Tesco's own brand or whatever it happens to be um, if you look on the back of it now some of them will say spray on wipe off straight away okay but a lot of them will say there is a three minute contact time or a five minute contact time or whatever it happens to be and that means that when you spray it on you have to leave it for the three minutes or the five minutes for it to do what it has mm -hmm. to do and then you wipe it off but mm -hmm. yeah a lot of people just and I know a lot of people in hospitality, you know, I go in and I say, so tell me about the chemical you're using. Oh, we're using this. So what's the contact time? What? what what's contact time? I'm like, well, yeah. and then I go up and I go and look up their information sheets and I'm saying, that's, that's a 10 minute contact time. So you might as well have just sprayed water on that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think with those things at home, it's usually quite short, isn't it? Yes. Because they probably know no one is going <laughs> to. Yeah. Because everybody's going to spray it. Exactly. Is there yeah. anything else that? The other problem too, Agata, is, you know, yeah. why do we have so many allergies? Why, yeah, why are why that, yeah. so many? Why is it that thirty years ago we didn't have the same issues with, um, you know, eczema, asthma to a certain extent, allergies? Because asthma and allergies are very closely linked. Is it to do with the amount of cleaning products that we have in our house. I mean, I know that my mother still, my, like my mum's 60 odd, um, she doesn't have antibacterial spray in her house. You know? <gasps> no, no antibacterial spray in the house. No. But I find, wonder, is there, you know, obviously it's a very personal thought, but is there a link yeah. between us being so super clean now you know yeah, and, and, and we yeah. don't like our children to get dirty and you know we don't you know no don't be playing in the mud because it's dirty and 
bath on people every day. I never had, when I was a child, I didn't have a bath every night. It was once a week. <laughs> 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 I know. So five second rule, Helen, five second rule when we drop something. Is that a thing? It doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. I I see. So I think that maybe five seconds is actually good because that would kind of build up your antibodies, whatever. If you eat something. If you're in the environment, do what you want. Obviously, if I was, you know, in hospitality, I'd be saying no, just go straight in the bin. Um, Yeah, yeah. But I, I do believe that we have to be exposed to a certain amount of bacteria, etc., for us to become immune to it. And, uh, you know, the same goes for um, pregnant women. Recently, in the last sort of year and a half, two years, pregnant women have now been told that they can eat nuts or peanuts as long as there's no family history of a peanut allergy. Because prior to that, mm-hmm. we were all told, no, you can't eat peanuts when you're pregnant. Well, you know, mm-hmm. How's the, the baby going to build up to immunity to it unless it's been exposed? So, um, mm-hmm. you know, I do think we are too, too clean. If you drop something on the floor and you're at home, you know how clean the floor is. It's up to you. Yeah, yeah you um, know yourself. If you haven't mopped the floor for a while, yeah. it goes straight in the bin. <laughs> yeah exactly i think as you say it's a bit of common sense as well isn't it like you know yourself and yeah definitely is there anything else when it comes to food safety and food prep at home that people should be aware of maybe some um, that we don't one thing that is quite dangerous and a lot of people do it is they buy their whole chicken you know for their sunday lunch and then they wash it on yeah. the tap. um and by doing that you're actually splashing bacteria over your kitchen okay windows. Um, and the bacteria from chicken, it could be a compi- compilobacter is actually the most common one. We're, we tend to be familiar with salmonella, but compilobacter would be the most common one. And something like 37% of supermarket packaging has compilobacter on the outside of the packaging. Um, so that's why when you're even doing your grocery shop, and make sure you put your raw meats into a separate bag um, because you don't want to contaminate your oranges or apples or whatever yeah. it happens to be with, with mm-hmm. compilobacter bacteria. It can be very, mm-hmm. very serious. And when it comes to freezing stuff, is there anything that we should really remember? Because we often know, especially now, you buy things in bulk to do your one essential shop a week. And people, you know, activate their fridges, freezers in the garages. So is there anything that we need to bear in mind with freezing food? I would just say with freezers, um, things will keep indefinitely. Um, and chest freezers can be a wee bit of a nightmare. You know the chest freezers where you just keep yeah. putting more stuff and more stuff and the stuff at the bottom never never gets used because you put more stuff on top of it um uh, but apart from that no freezers are good but on a fridge point of view don't overstock your fridge so you know at christmas when the day before christmas eve everybody goes out and does their shopping and they shop yeah. for i don't know they shop for three weeks because they think the supermarket's not going to be open again when really it's open the day after boxing day yeah and they cram their fridge completely full with stuff. The air can't circulate, so the temperature of the fridge rises. Okay. Oh, okay. So that would be my one tip, even at this time when people are, because I think yeah. we're used to sort of going out and shopping and doing wee bits and pieces most days, and now most people are doing a once a week shop, so they're they're cramming yeah. so much stuff in their fridge. Just don't overstock your fridge because your air can't circulate within the fridge. Then. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you so much. I've got one million other questions, but I don't think we've got time tonight. So if you would like to join us again in a few weeks' time, I would yeah. love it. Because it was so, so important. Thank you so, so much, Helen. Um, and now just to um, sum it up, just like with previous chats on Wednesdays we had, as it is a chat with Simply Grow, I'm going to ask you about the three things that you do for your own personal growth, because Simply Grow is not just about sensory classes, it's all about a kind of holistic approach to growing yourself as a person and starting very young, but also kind of carrying on as an adult. So what would be your three things that you do for your own growth? Okay, Ellen? well, um, I'm a member of a couple of referral networking groups, B&I and I and Mums at Work, so that's for my business growth. Uh, personally, I'm a Reiki master. Um, so I would, so fascinating. <laughs> I, I would do a lot of Reiki on myself and on my son. And I just find that completely for half an hour, 45 minutes, just completely chills me out, relaxes. Um, and I do that. And then I do a lot of reading. Um, and at the minute I'm reading this lecture notes. So have... Okay, very good. So that's what I'm reading at the minute. Um, <laughs> it's for my nap probably, but... <laughs> I 
yeah, I, I'm reading I have three or four different books on the go at the minute, so one's on that, and then and I'm also doing a sports injuries course, um, so I'm doing that. So yeah, I just continually like to be in something. I do tropic skincare, I and mean, again, I find that's a really good of just good way of relaxing. I just like once a week we'll do face masks and everything else. Yeah, chill out and and have some me time because yeah. I think. Yeah. Right, quite busy i i um even at the minute with lockdown i i'm recording videos i'm doing a lot of zoom calls i'm um, doing an online food safety course next week starting on monday um so just keeping myself really really busy so we all need that wee bit of me time and that wee bit of downtime definitely thank you so much so if anyone would like to get in touch with you uh we mentioned the videos that you record so if anyone would like to follow you on good training on facebook and instagram those yeah. videos guys are so informative they're fantastic basically just like in a nutshell everything you have to know about different emergency situations and um, anything else that um any other way people can reach out to you and um, um also LinkedIn. Um, or you can email me helen at goodytrainingsolutions.co.uk um, even just lift the phone if there's something that you're thinking oh I don't know what I should do in this situation should I go to the hospital lift the phone and ring me now I'm, I might ask you to send me a photograph so I can see what it's like um, <laughs> but, but don't be scared to lift the phone and ring you know I'm I'm not a medical professional I'm not I'm not a doctor I'm not a nurse but sometimes people just need that wee bit of reassurance well yes I think you should maybe just take them up to the hospital just to get it checked out mm -hmm. um, or no look do this try this um, yeah so lift mm -hmm. the phone and ring send me an email whatever that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Helen. Really appreciate that. We're going to make it available for 24 hours now on Instagram. Okay. And then I'm going to upload the video onto Simply Rose YouTube channel so anyone can watch it at any time. And we're going to write a little follow-up uh, blog post about it just to kind of sum it up if anyone prefers to read it rather than uh, watch it. But I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It was fantastic to have you. Right I on. hope that you are <laughs> coping okay in the lockdown as well yeah. fingers crossed not gonna last much longer I know. um but please stay safe and we'll be in touch and have a lovely rest of the evening relaxing <laughs> all right take care. thank you so much take care bye-bye